Welcome, everyone. We'll give folks a little bit of time to keep arriving, but welcome, welcome, welcome to the San Francisco Dharma Collective. And for folks who maybe haven't been here before, there are cushions, there is tea in the back, um, as well as a restroom. And um, yeah, I like to call this the hot lava zone, like everyone's afraid they're going to incinerate, but actually you totally can sit there if you want. Nothing bad will happen. And yeah, I think we still have some extra chairs around. There's one there. There's one right there. Even in the front. Isn't it nice to wear like sweaters again? Yes. No, you were into it? Oh my God. Do you like live in a kiddie pool or something? I mean, it was so hot. Okay. I'm glad to hear there's more than one experience. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's wonderful to be with you all here tonight. And as many of you know, this is the Well of Being Wednesday. I am Eve Ekman. I get to support you all in your practice here tonight. And the San Francisco Dharma Collective is an entirely volunteer run center. Woohoo! Many volunteers are in the room. If you wouldn't mind raising your hands. These are all people who are welcoming you here and whose generosity allows us all to be here. So really sweet to just think of kind of the vehicle that we have here, which is with each other and for each other. And I'm always kind of blown away because you could be anywhere tonight. You could be watching a movie or bowling or eating ramen. And uh, maybe you will do all those things before or after, but that you decide to come here. Uh, it's so beautiful and that we get to be here in this shared space where we practice and we reflect and we connect. This is, um, yeah, a really precious time to be together. And at the Dharma Collective, the way that we do this Well of Being Wednesday is we keep following this text. And I, I kind of love the challenge of having to, in some ways, encapsulate everything we've already read for folks who might not have been here before but also move us forward. We definitely only make it a couple pages a night, but we are on chapter five already. And we're following this text, which is the Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. So this is an eighth century text, and this secondary commentary here by the beloved Pema Chodron, who helps kind of make it a bit more um, psychologically oriented and informed, a bit more understandable um, for some of us and yeah, it's such a beautiful text. It's the third time I've taught it in the last seven years, and I keep finding so much new freshness in this text. Um, and I think what I'm excited about teaching tonight, I'm not actually sure I've ever taught it before. Like I look at my old notes from different years, and I'm like, oh, I just skipped that last time. But this year, it feels especially relevant. So kind of fun to have that kind of ongoing um, learning from these texts. And so just as a, a bit of a recap for where we've been in the last couple weeks. So last week, Taylor was here as I was on retreat. Was that awesome? Yay, yeah, Taylor's so cool. Um, so glad she was here with you all. And the week before that, which I know is, you know, might seem a million years ago, we were doing this series on Vedana, on the feeling tone pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral, and really kind of digging into how those practices help us understand the way we react to what's happening, as opposed to experience what's happening. So we have an immediate sensation, maybe it's a smell or uh, some feeling of touch, and we don't actually just experience that touch in its purest form or that smell in its purest form almost immediately the mind rises up as I like and I don't like. And they're in, welcome, come in, no problem. There's a chair over there. And um, immediately we construct not only you know, a preference about liking or not liking, we also often create a story and a ruminative process. And then we stay in that ruminative process. 
So by doing these practices of really focusing on Vedana, on the way that we reach out towards or fall away from all the different sensory phenomena, help us understand in a very concrete, down on the ground way, what is suffering and what is liberation? Well, at a simple level, suffering is wanting what you don't have and not wanting what you do, right? That kind of, oh, I don't like that. I don't like that smell. I don't like that taste. I don't like that sound. And then that craving on the other side. And you may remember um, the full-blown hell of insatiable desire that we <laughs> talked about two weeks ago. And that's when it's not just, I like it, it's, I need it. And the story that uh, Pema Chodron shared, this kind of um, classic teaching using a very intense metaphor of, you know, craving an insatiable desire is like walking up a mountain of razor blades towards what appears to be a very alluring, like, woman. And you get there, and then it's actually a demon, and they bite your head off. And then you do it again. <laughs> That's the full-blown hell of insatiable desire, right? And it sounds like silly, but <laughs> if you ever pick up your phone and you're looking for something to feel good and instead you feel bad, you know the pull of insatiable desire, right? Like continuing to go back over and over to something that you're hoping will be that alluring beauty or sense of care. And in fact, it bites your head off. Right? It puts you into the comparing mind, insufficient mind. So that's the way that we can understand the kind of most extreme form of that Vedana. And this whole chapter, chapter five, is titled Taming the Mind, or Taming the Wildness of the Mind. And a metaphor that's been given throughout the chapter is the mind like a wild elephant. And one of the ways in which that wild elephant, I mean, not only is a wild elephant uh, quite a beast to be contended with, it ends up trampling the very source of our well-being. Like our mind that is that wild and crazed and, you know, just distracted and stressed ends up actually trampling the very seeds that would lead to our own happiness. And so the kind of beseeching plea of Shantideva in this chapter is you need to tether that wild elephant of the mind with mindfulness. You have to keep it so close. You have to really start to develop and train your attention because it doesn't matter you know, how many beautiful prayer beads you have. It doesn't matter how many uh, empowerments you get or how many um, devotional practices you do. It gives all these examples. If you can't, at the most basic level, tether the mind, which doesn't mean the mind has no thoughts, the mind is just calm and peaceful. It means you have enough awareness to continue to invite the mind to return. Then there's no moving forward in the practice. And I was saying, you know, it was very sobering to hear that. I know it's true. Um, and then I got to go, go on retreat for a week with that knowing. And I'm, I'm really happy to say, I really feel like when you are dedicating even one day to practice, you know, to clear seeing, that wild elephant does become more tameable. And I hope tonight we get a little sense of reprieve from some of that incessant uh, mind trampling. But tonight, I also, I'd really love us to look at another, you know, there's all these different kind of doorways into finding quiescence of the mind and being able to calm the mind. So there is shamatha, these attention practices, and there's also, kind of the, these practices that relate to when the mind can move beyond any sense of good or bad. When the mind rests in this more peaceful, what's often called non-dual state. So if we're not pushing towards or away from, there's this rest and it's not a vacant place. Many times in the Sangha, we've practiced this spacious open awareness that's naturally infused with compassion and love, right? That our very awareness, without constructing or doing anything, our very awareness is a source of joy. And not like fireworks joy. It's just this source of such deep contentment and peace. So that's um, 
That's what we're going to do. How about that? Who wants that? <laughs> Way easier than tethering the elephant of the mind, right? Let's just try to take our way more deeply into that sense of intrinsic joy. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, give us a little bit of preamble so you have a sense of, you know, what we are doing this for, why we are doing this practice in specific. And the meditation will essentially kind of invite us through a practice of rejoicing or empathetic joy um, for this body, for this breath, for this mind. And I think of that almost like that's when a, a bird would be flapping its wings, like getting some air. And then we use that momentum to be able to rest more, just in joy, just with joy. So we're going to come into the practice through this more explicit, empathetic joy. And this is one of the four immeasurable practices of the heart. If you've never heard that before, no problem. If you have, that's your context. Um, but you need no prior experience with those to give this a try. I invite you to find a posture that's supportive. And that's having this kind of uprightness of the spine, as well as a sense of kind of softness through the face and the chest and the belly. I'm taking a couple moments, especially if this is a newer space, somewhere you haven't been before, to really taking in this room there are other beings here. There is Jimmy at the door who is protecting us from the outer realms. And no one in this room knows everyone in this room. But we can take a little bit of comfort in being here for a shared purpose. And practicing in Sangha with others, it accelerates our practice. So each one of us here makes even more benefit for every person in the room in their practice. So you can consider having the eyes gently closed or softly open. And for the first couple breaths, really feeling the sense of being in this room through all the sense portals, the temperature, the relative light. And sense of sound of other beings in this room and outside this room. And we can take together what could be our first intentional breaths of the day. So lengthening through the inhale, slowly drawing in for the count of three or four. Gently holding at the top. Releasing also through the nose for three or four more breaths. And twice more. Lengthening that inhale in. Holding at the top. And releasing. One more time. And for the next couple breaths, invite a balancing of these two essential qualities of our practice. A sense of vividness and brightness through the inhale, lengthening up through the spine, and an ease and relaxation through the exhale, softening and melting through the front of the body.
And in this phase of the practice, we really are gathering our attention inward. So whenever the mind wanders, we just gently relax, release, and return. Now bringing our full attention and awareness to the entire body. And engaging this sense of rejoicing for this body. A sense of rejoicing for all the various senses and the ways we experience the world, we experience others. While sometimes inconvenient or awkward or achy, having a human body is also a source of such delight. And so for a couple of breaths, finding this quality of rejoicing as we attend to the body. If it's hard to find a sense of joy in the body, that's no problem. You could imagine what joy would feel like, what goodness has felt like. This is just a way of orienting the mind and supporting our attention to be right here with the body. When the mind gets carried away by distraction, thought, memory, or image, notice what it's like to return. Maybe we can refresh that sense of enjoyment and rejoicing each time we come back to the body. As we attend closely to the body, this beautiful wave-like form of the breath is so palpable. And we direct now this rejoicing, this appreciation for the breath, for this magical exchange from outer to inner and outer again. Feeling the breath as it travels in the body, breathes the body. Continuing to follow this breath as it leaves the body and returns back into the spaciousness all around. And so letting our mind be tethered now to this 
warm appreciation of breath, the magic of breath, the spirit of breath. Consider how kind you can be with yourself when the mind gets carried away. Just simply find the first response to be a relaxing. And then releasing whatever has captured the attention and rejoicing in the return to being with the breath. Relaxing, releasing, rejoicing as we reunite with the breath each time. We now gently shift this loving attention and awareness from the breath and the body to the mind. Just as we notice the wave of the breath rise and fall, can we notice and feel appreciation for thought formations as they come and go? And also noticing the spaces between our thoughts where we get that glimpse of greater awareness. So feel and imagine a sense of leaning back in the mind. and observing with this loving attention and awareness all that arises in the mind thoughts, memories, images without energizing or get carried away 
And if we do, again, just relaxing, releasing, and rejoicing, turning to this awareness of thoughts. It can feel challenging in this practice to not get immediately swept away. No problem. Just keep coming back to that which notices you've been carried away. The awareness, which is where these thoughts arise from, and they come back to. This awareness can have a quality of spaciousness, openness, but not dull, very bright. So this alive, spacious, clear, open awareness, and the thoughts that arise like the clouds passing through. Well, the thoughts have a quality of movement. We can notice or imagine the quality of stillness of our awareness. That which is not the thought arising and moving, passing away or carrying us with it. But that quality which recognizes we've been carried away, unperturbed, just like the sky, even when ferocious winds and clouds and storms come, remains at its essence, unperturbed. So see if you can 
rest in that sky-like awareness of the mind as the weather of the mind is moving, finding that stillness of awareness. And more and more, see if it's possible to find that sense of resting in awareness. You're still observing of the phenomena of the mind arising. But as we notice this sense of our awareness, we may feel or imagine there's a warmth. That awareness isn't just a cold abyss. At its fundamental essence, there's a loving quality to our awareness, a kindness. It could feel like light. It could feel like heart. Without trying to force or generate, just bring curiosity to the nature, the true nature of mind and awareness. Maybe we could feel something akin to a unfabricated freshness of the mind in its natural state. Maybe thoughts keep carrying us away, no problem. Every time we notice we've been carried away, we just relax, release, and return now to this more spacious, sense of our awareness, awareness that is above us, behind us, below us, all around, without boundary, without limit. more and more becoming aware of our awareness. Thoughts still come and go, but our awareness is resting in awareness. This unfabricated freshness of the mind. resting in the awareness of our awareness. There is no need to think about what's next or what has happened. 
we can release those familiar points of identity and reification. Just relaxing into this expansive sense of present awareness. Or whatever glimpses of it shine through thoughts, memories, and images. If there is any quality of pleasantness experienced through this resting in awareness, consider it the deepest nourishment for our compassion and the fertile ground for our wisdom. And without uprooting or needing to leave the sense of being aware of our awareness, we regather some of our attention to the body and to the breath, rejoicing once again to be embodied, receiving each breath as a gift. Thank you for your practice. So, as we constellate here every week as a community, as a Sangha, it's so important for us to make the practice not only what we're doing in meditation, but the practice of being in community so that when we share and that we listen, we bring these qualities of compassion and mindfulness so that when we speak, we're really speaking with a consideration of how can I be of most benefit? How can I be the most kind? And then when we're listening also, can I really hold what's being said? with openness and kindness. And that allows all of us here the opportunity to share and reflect. And even maybe most importantly, holding yourself in kindness. So using this time together 
as we practice to completely let go of any negative self-oriented thinking. I know it's a high bar and I, I can't call you out if you're doing it because I can't read your mind yet. It'll be one of my very first cities if I get enough spiritual accomplishment. I would love to read all your minds. But until then, please just consider, yeah, that possibility of being so kind with yourself so that we can be so kind with each other here. Um, I'd love to hear from anyone questions or reflections on your practice. We have a mic here, Kate has a mic, so that our friends at home can hear us. It's not amplified, just a way for folks to stay connected. Any questions, reflections? Yes, please. Let me share your name. My name is Y. I was just reflecting on neediness and needs. Mm. And the context of this is when I feel too needy, I'm craving. Mm. But yet, sometimes we have needs, <laughs> like an apple versus a Snickers bar. <laughs> because the apple at that moment actually may be something I need because I need to feel nourished or even having something that's sweet. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, you talked about the insatiable mm. um, version of desire, but what if, what, I love to hear a little more of desire that may be joyful. Yes, I would love, I would love to answer that, but I'd be also curious about your practice. Right. Or no, just recently that we just did together. There were moments that I felt at ease, mm. um, very comforted. Yeah. Uh, and then when we moved into something more mental, and even before we did so, mm. um, I couldn't help but have my thoughts come to this, which is why I wanted to say something. I see. To ask. Okay. Because I, it just it kind of, in a good way, I was reflecting. Yeah. <laughs> but it also stirred. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm just, I was curious how the question arose from practice. Um, so the very simple answer is there is desire without fixation. There's also healthy aversion without fixation. I'm, I'm not even, well, I don't know if I'd go for Snickers bar, maybe one of those like, you know, organic versions that's like fancier, um, just so you're not putting uh, bad ingredients into your body but it's the fixation that creates the unwholesomeness, right? That we, we can't just want it, enjoy it, like it's insatiable over and over. And we also confuse, and this is why it's interesting in practice, you know, part of that practice, and it, it is, for some people in this room, the style of practice we just did is actually a lot easier than a whole 30 minutes of focusing on the breath. For other people, just focusing on the breath, that is their bliss. There's really different approaches, but a lot of meditation, you know, at an implicit and sometimes explicit um, level reminds us that whatever it is we're seeking out there is, is really like fulfilled here. Of course, we still need to eat apples and food and right, all those things. But maybe when we're talking about something like the Snickers bar, we are doing that kind of sublimation what we really want is to feel connected and cared for, but what we're getting is like this, you know, reward, like in, this, in the moment that actually isn't fulfilling over time. So that would be like an unwholesome want and desire. So I'd say like the two levels to your question is, you know, are we really clear on the desire? And in the two weeks ago session, I was talking about the researcher Judson Brewer, who's done this wonderful research on craving and addiction. And one of his interventions is see gratification to its end. It's actually a saying from the Buddha. Really notice the entire contour of your craving so that you can notice that actually, you know, the more Snickers bar you have, you don't feel better. So instead of like, I shouldn't have that, I don't want it. He has found it a much more successful approach to addiction to say, really notice 
what it's like. And like, yeah, there's some good, but there's also the other kind of cascade of things going on. And then the first part I said, which is, it's okay to have desire if, if you don't fixate around it. If it doesn't keep you up, if it doesn't pull you away, if it doesn't um, get in the way. So, thanks, why? I'm not sure I've seen you here before, so. I was here two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, first okay. Time. Okay, well, nice to see you. Thank you. Yeah, welcome back. Anyone else, a reflection on that practice? Yes, Rob. <sighs> Um, oh, it seems like it might be helpful to share this. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been meditating for a while now, and um, you know, recently I, there, it's it's been a little there's been a lot of thoughts. <laughs> you know, but there's always a lot of thoughts. But recently, I've been very much noticing, and the begin the first half of this meditation was I really struggled with following I mean I, I followed thoughts yeah right? and, and 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 I kept coming back because you so gracefully kept reminding me to <laughs> and then uh, something changed and um, and so instead of having these strings of thoughts that would play out and I've had this experience before but it was very real this time, instead of having these strings of, of thoughts that would play out, there was utter chaos of a lot of different fragments of thoughts, mm. just going and going and going, and me in awareness, just watching it, mm. and not being pulled into, you know, sometimes there would be a little tug, a little yeah. emotional tug, but there was this just beautiful, equanimous, peaceful feeling of just sitting back in awareness and watching the this storm yeah of thoughts that never ever actually turned into a a full-on thought like not more than you know a word or yeah. a fragment or a light or yeah a, you know just but a lot of it and and not being touched by it and it was beautiful meditation yeah. thank you yeah thank uh, you and i am glad you shared and i'm curious you know was there because yes and there's many stanzas tonight that will reflect what you're describing right which is this when we can successfully tether the mind with mindfulness and, and the different qualities of mindfulness introspection uh, as well as this kind of remembering to be here and not caught there is this way that we can go anywhere, we can be with anything, because we have that fundamental protection, right, of um, knowing our true refuge in awareness. And I'm curious, did you find a warmth in awareness? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Can you describe that? Well, until the end, it wasn't really like it was in my body. Mm. It was just, just a warm, not like it was a sensation. I don't know how to describe this. It's, yeah, no, it was a hard question. <laughs> it's, it's a, it's just a knowing of, it just, this isness of yeah. warmth that, it's, warmth is a good, seems like warmth is a good descriptor for yeah. something kind of undescribable. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, and it was just this, just safety and like a lack of need. Yeah. To right. To do anything. Yes. About what's happening. Yeah. Just, just resting and yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Such a beautiful reflection of your dedication to practice too. Yeah. And if you didn't have that experience, don't worry. Okay. <laughs> That's not every time, as, as Ron said, he's been struggling with thoughts, but it is really nice to hear from folks when there's um, something that feels stable, helps us all kind of know where we're pointing to, um, even if it feels a little different. Anyone else, questions? Yes, Gage, and then Chris. More of a comment. Comment, um, please. Inspired by Ron, I too was having a really hard time with thoughts and kept who here was having a hard time with thoughts? 
<laughs> Good. You guys were not asleep. Nice work. <laughs> no, it was the opposite. I, it was like, I must have had coffee or a yerba mate or something. Um, but then you, I think I did come to enough to hear you say, like, find joy in your having thoughts. And at first it was really, I was very averse to it. And I was just like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but then it, it, it loosened up. And I was like, maybe I am grateful for these thoughts or that it's precious that I can thank them. And I'm grateful for them in most places of my life. Hmm. And I can like take care of myself and, you know, and other things. So uh, it was just a, a weird shift of like, because I was I was super annoyed by them. Like, why is this happening? I I keep you know I was coming back so much, and then I, I was able to mm. kind of shift that a little bit, and it felt really nice. Wonderful. Um, I don't know if it will stick, but yeah. Um, but even and it. like that noticing with warmth, you know, like that's a different. Um, it's like a whole different vantage point than just being in the thoughts. Yeah, it did kind of like put me in the middle of them where I was like, oh, maybe this storm doesn't have to yeah. be so annoying to me. Yeah. Like, irritating. And if we could, all of us, remember when we are caught up in a difficult emotion that it isn't the entirety of our experience, like liberation would be right next, you know? And so it's how many times can we touch into that in practice and start to really be like, oh yeah, the illusory nature of these thoughts and emotions, like they really are just coming and going. And I think practicing in them in this way, it's hard to um, want the like direct experience of that in our day to day. But I, I, I will say um, it's the training ground and we do start to feel it slowly, I know. You said that even too, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Chris, did you have a question or comment? I'm just gonna, I think that's the answer. Yeah. Mm. Sure. So I've been coming to Well of Being Wednesdays for, I just did the math, a year and a half. Yay, oh. oops. And, <laughs> and you outdid yourself this evening, Aww. my teacher. Uh, I, I entered that state where I think I can count on my fingers the number of times in my life where I have actually forgotten mm. that this is work. Mm. It was just like I, f I found that flow. Mm. Uh, and I don't know, I'm a lot older than a lot of people here, but when I was a kid there was this song, The Bear climbed up the mountain, the bear climbed up the mountain to see what he could see, mm -hmm. he saw another mountain. So I am feeling like the bear that just sat down on that <laughs> damn mountain, and this is my mountain, I've mm -hmm. climbed this mountain, you can have that mountain, and as a matter of fact, I'm actually feeling quite wild and strong, mm -hmm. and if I were covered in fur, it would be very thick and soft. <laughs> you kind of are. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, I'm delighted that people enjoy the heat, yeah. but yeah, I absolutely delighted in stopping yeah. at community thrift on my way here today. Yes, and, up a new yes. and, and Chris, I'll say, I mean, maybe, you know, I am coming off retreat, so there, you know, that can help with um, guidance, but also, you know, you have outdone yourself, right, in dropping into your own practice, so. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Yes, Ulysses. Thank you, Eve. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious, when you talk about that warmth, is it like a physical sense that you're talking about, or is it more of a, like Ron said, like an inner awareness of an, an knowing or knowledge of so is it something physical or something like perceived? Like you, if you tell somebody, do you know what warmth feels like? And I could say yes, right. or is it an actual sensation? And it's more like warmth as in, do you know what it feels like when a um, beloved furry being, you know, curls up on your lap? Actually, that can be also physical warmth. Mm -hmm. You see them walk by, or you know, like that sense of like, oh. Okay. It's the tenderness kind of warmth, yeah. Makes sense. And yeah. why? And why do you ask? 
Because when I when I when I'm doing a meditation and I'm there, yeah, you know, it's, um, I do feel that warmth, but I also get physically yes. very warm. That also beautiful. You know, yeah, so, like yeah. very warm. Yeah, yeah. So there's other like, um, nodding. Usually, that's catalyzed more by specific types of breathing and practices that open the central channel. Um, I don't talk a lot about the central channel here maybe one day, um, but it's, um, you know, you look at many of these different systems and I know you, you know the body so well and, and these other subtle body systems and the chakras, right? And there's this idea that the subtle body opens when we practice and the subtle body actually feels bigger than our body. And there's a warmth that sometimes is generated through the subtle body opening. So it's not unusual. And then, you know, Tumo practices, which Wim Hof breathing is based upon, folks may be familiar with that. The Tumo practices, you read these beautiful accounts um, in Tibet. I was reading the um, autobiography of Mathieu Ricard, wonderful teacher. We read his book here a couple of years ago. Um, and he talks about these, you know, a whole monastery of monks, you know, out on the, you know, Tibetan plateau where it's, you know, so much snow, almost a glacier, and they all they have like a wet sheet on them, and they're practicing tumo and just staying warm and like melting the ice as it like forms on the sheets. So and that I know it's wild. So there is like an inner heat through those specific breath practices, and and those are really focused on central channel and kind of cultivating a connection between lunar and solar. Um, but or and just to say in our practice, I think subtle body opening also creates warmth at a physiological level. And then there's the tenderness warmth too. Thank you. Yeah, how was your practice? It's lovely, thank you. Good, okay, thank you. All right, yes, please, yeah, yeah. Um, so my question is about negative emotions and meditation. And yeah. I guess my experience today was um i came in in like a very fine mood and then like we sat down to quiet and it just like sadness arose mm. um and there wasn't a thought attached to it it was just like the yeah. sensation of it and yeah i'm just curious the relation between like emotions arising in meditation is that like us processing them um and like you know <laughs> You focus on that, mm -hmm. um, but it, it felt like I couldn't like follow the practice yeah. as you were guiding. Yeah, um, thank you for sharing that. And um, a couple things. Um, we did the handshake with emotion practice three weeks. Were you here for that one? Mm -hmm. That can be really uh, useful when strong emotions arise in practice. So it's a way, you know, which we just orient to the pure experience of sensation of emotion. And when we do so, it often will kind of naturally rise and fall on its own. Um, as long as we aren't putting the story to it or, or perpetuating the story. Um, so that's just one thing to say that that practice, Sokni Rinpoche created it in order for people who have strong emotions arise when they're doing shamatha or other practices to just turn towards it um, and let it release into the body. And in fact, it's this idea of kind of opening the blockages in the subtle body. And then, you know, a big other part is absolutely when we meditate. And sometimes it's the only space we give ourselves to not be doing. And so emotions, especially sadness, right, is one that if we keep ourselves almost completely busy, we can almost entirely avoid. And yet, you know, there's both our personal grief and sorrow, and then there is the universal grief and sorrow, what's sometimes called the unconditioned, genuine heart of sorrow. And that's the warrior's heart of sorrow. This whole bodhisattva path is how do we cultivate that unconditioned, genuine heart of sorrow and become a compassionate warrior in the world. So not to avoid and deny our sadness, but to find a way to use it in some ways to help us turn towards. But the way we turn towards is like 
forging so much compassion internally so that it doesn't feel um, kind of burdensome to turn towards that suffering. It doesn't feel like too much. It feels like that's the natural inclination of the heart, right? Um, and so, you know, in addition to handshake practice, handshake can have a quality of compassion and caring, but there's also this way in which we can, without needing to be overly, um, because there's a way sometimes we can like compassion our sadness away like too quickly and lose the, the fullness of it. But just this sense of, you know, I feel care for this sadness. I, I feel care for this. Me, just like everyone, carries sadness and sorrow. It matters. I care. So that's like another way of just being with. Um, sometimes strong emotions in our practice will bring us an insight and help us understand the root or source of those difficult emotions. Has anyone ever had that? Like, not a, yeah, not realizing you're angry or afraid or sad and the emotion arises and you're like, oh, wow, yeah. But sometimes, especially with sadness, you know, this um, beautiful term I learned from my dear friend, Sarah, of the kind of collective emotional nervous system, right? It's not just like your emotion how much of these are going around all of us right so um yeah and i i i really do think that being connected with our sorrow is a um what's the word bless you i don't think there's any progress on a spiritual path without it um it just is a it's a super necessary part of being an embodied human and if we have no contact with it um, we won't really be able to find that true spark for compassion. But our compassion shouldn't make us feel despair. So if the sadness turns to despair, there's a self-related concern that's happening. This is too much for me. I can't handle it, right? And, um, you know, we have a, another compassion expert in the room here, so we will uh, see if he has something to say about it. But um, I think it's, you know, interesting to think about how do we soften that sense of it's mine and I'm alone when that sadness turns to despair. Um, and sometimes like we just got to go all the way with our grief, like all the way. And that doesn't mean we're self-related or self whatever. We're just letting the grief grieve us, right? It's, it's healthy to let our sadness fully move through us. And there's no, of course, the there's a, a clinical distinction of when we should, you know, move on with our life. But for most of us, it's a personal understanding of when are we wallowing in our grief? When are we suppressing our grief? And then where's that healthy balance? So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> good. Surprising's good. All right. So I'm going to move on to a little bit more of what we're going to uh, get in tonight with these teachings. Thank you all for your shares and questions. Um, yeah, there is, and, and this is kind of what Ron alluded to, and I just wanted to highlight this verse. This is from um, the reading we did last time together, but the most, probably most famous reading in this entire book. And this is from Shantideva. To cover all the earth with sheets of hide, where would such amounts of skin be found? But simply wrap some leather around your feet, and it's as if the whole earth had been covered. So these practices are essentially, they're like wrapping our mind, right, with this protection of being attentive, being compassionate, so that we can go anywhere. We can be in the wildness of our own thoughts. We can be in the wildness and suffering of this world. But we have this like ability to do so without having to um, kind of pull back or hold back. And so that was from the last week. And then, yeah, it's so interesting. So this, this entire book goes through these nine or eight chapters. There's a ninth chapter that Pema Chodron decided to not include because she thinks it's too complicated. Uh, and I don't blame her, because that entire chapter is on non-duality. 
Um, I think, I don't think we're going to use the Dalai Lama's version, but we'll use a different version of the ninth chapter. Um, but she kind of jumps from this fifth chapter, which is very much about attention and awareness, into this glimpse of non-duality, which is why we did this practice here together tonight. So the first stanza here is, all who fail to know and penetrate this secret of the mind, the Dharma's peak, although they wish for joy and sorrow's end, will wander uselessly in misery. So all who fail to know and penetrate the secret of the mind, the Dharma's peak, although they wish for joy and sorrow's end, will wander uselessly in misery. And this Dharma's peak, this is what the ninth chapter is all about. Um, so she says um, here, and I, I mentioned it a little bit in the meditation. Um, she says, what ultimately frees us from constricting patterns in the mind is to stop reifying our experience and connect with the ineffable, groundless nature of all phenomena. This nature cannot be said, said to exist or not exist or anything in between. <coughs> and then there's another stanza from Shantideva. When real and non-real both are absent from before the mind, nothing else remains for the mind to do but rest in perfect peace from concepts free. So when real and non-real both are absent from the mind. So this idea that when we are starting to kind of pierce and penetrate through things like the Vedana, like I like and I don't like, and we start to see, oh, there's just thoughts that arise or sensations that arise. They're neither good nor bad. And in fact, they're not always the same. They're always changing. They're not permanent. So this idea of when this idea or when real and non-real both are absent from the mind. So we're no longer caught up in our thoughts, taking us from one place to the next. I want this. I don't want this. We've kind of let go in the way that my teacher talks about it. We've let go of the reference points of our daily life. Like what's happening next? What's for dinner? What's for dessert? What am I doing tomorrow? Like whew, all of that. And not that we let it go and we just, you know, recede to a cave forever. It's that we let it go from being the main occupation of the mind. Um, nothing remains for the mind to do but rest in perfect peace. So the mind can rest in this perfect peace. And that's, again, it's not that in this perfect peace, we avoid or have ejected ourselves from the world. In this perfect peace, we respond to what needs to be responded to. And then when it's done, we let go. <laughs> yes, Ulysses. Can that perfect peace be the equivalent to just being truly present at every moment? Yes. Like absolutely present. Exactly. Is, yes. Is that, is that kind of what she's referring to? Yes. And she, this is what she says. There is, I mean, this, like I almost cried reading this. And that's why I was like, have I never <laughs> shared this before? There is no better use of a human life than to realize the unfabricated, non-conceptual freshness of our mind. There is no better use of a human life than to realize the unfabricated, non-conceptual freshness of our mind because this is the source of all wisdom and compassion. Not because it's a way to anesthetize ourselves away from the suffering of the world, but because this is the ground from which, right? If we're really present, without all our mishigas, without all our stuff, we can meet what's being asked of us just so plainly. You know, even sometimes I notice for myself, like I'm like, does that person need help? And then I get in my head and I'm like, oh, I don't know, am I the right person to offer them help, right? Like I'm not being present with what's actually needed. I'm second guessing. And so this idea of <clears throat> that our compassion arises from that quality of unfabricated freshness of the mind. I just love that, right? And that mean unfabricated, you know, the mind is responding with its natural wisdom. We don't go blank. We just stop the rumination. We stop the rumination. So we're like just more there freshly with it. Yeah. 
Good question. Yeah. Yes, your Tom. You're welcome to say anything about compassion that you would like to. Compassion. <laughs> uh, I wasn't going to say anything, but now I feel like I really want to because the thing that's been echoing in my mind the whole time is the sentence inside intermittent contact with peacefulness mm. and warmth. And part of my day job is teaching compassion focused therapy. Uh, to first year students, which really means I get to watch super awkward therapy all the time on video. <laughs> a lot of heartfelt intentions. And I've just been thinking all evening that yesterday I watched a video of a client who's been depressed his whole life mm. and he was receiving a meditation that was very heartfelt and maybe less skillful. And, and nonetheless, you know, he came out of it and he said, I feel so close to peacefulness. I feel mm. so close to peacefulness. And I watched it and I was nervous beyond words because I'm not sure that after a lifetime of depression he will be now switching over to constant contact with peacefulness. Right. I kind of warned the student like let's talk about intermittent contact yeah. because flight to light and Icarus and Daedalus and the, you know the thing melting <laughs> and we crashed like I just yeah. went through all of that because that really scared me to see yeah. how excited he is to oh I will now switch over to peacefulness it'll be yes. great I want that too by the way <laughs> but, but, but I don't live there and yeah. even this practice which was a delight yeah. I, I, I had a glimpse and then I went yes. elsewhere I got a look. so like I'm showing being in contact with this intermittent peacefulness that I have that contact mm. and, and I don't know that it would be consistent yeah. and yet we're talking about this really sublime ideal and I'm just curious how you reconcile yeah. how you beautiful beautiful and thank you for sharing um, and I think you know it's interesting I was going to talk a little bit about shamatha tonight and, and we'll probably talk about it next week too and shamatha which is this practice of training the mind and attention you know and kind of this calm abiding attention there are nine stages of shamatha and they go I mean, it's very intense, the reading on them, and so beautiful. My kind of root teacher, Alan Wallace, wrote a book, uh, maybe two or three books on shamatha. And there is a phase of shamatha that's called patchy attention, right? And so it is kind of that intermittent. So there is, for sure, in the traditions, like a deep understanding that these states that we, and often this word is translated, I think, from Sanskrit as glimpses. Like we get these glimpses. And so in the practice, I, I doubt, I, would, I hope, maybe Ron got a little close, but I think most of us got glimpses. We didn't get like, here I am truly resting in loving awareness. Again, it's like the wings flap it, you know, you get, you get like a little bit of it, and then you get to rest, and then you gotta kinda work at it again and come back. And so there very much is that quality I think it's interesting, you know, the equivalent when you have folks do like a week long retreat and they're like, oh my God, I figure I'm never going to be, you know, that neurotic, stressed out person again. <laughs> Has anyone ever had that? And then like three days later, you're like, oh, <laughs> fully back. <laughs> like, I don't know what that was on retreat, but that's not how I live. Right. So I think for most of us on the path, like, we do get these glimpses, these, I love this, intermittent experiences. And they do, you know, the thing that I feel is so important is when we get a glimpse that it helps us feel some spiritual confidence. That we know some, those like, oh yeah, there is another way. And so maybe for the patient, it's, wow, there is another way of being. I kind of got lucky. Because sometimes with meditation, you know, people like myself, man, I got dropped into kind of a non-dual absorption state with like no business being there very early in my practice life. And then I tried to be there for years and I couldn't get back. You know, I just had these two days of like, and um, it's, you know, it's wonderful that we can get these uh, very nourishing, you could call them ecstatic, but I think nourishing is a wholesome way states where we recognize like wow part of my true nature is bliss you know is warmth is compassion whatever you want to call it they, it really is a kind of similar feel and yeah it's not always there until we awaken um and you know i was saying yesterday to our um our small group practice that awakening isn't i'm not awake or i'm awake there's like this whole process where we get these like greater and greater glimpses of awakening. And it's very encouraging. 
And so when we have that, like your, this patient had, I understand the concern, especially with the clinical depression. But for many of us, it can be like that very confirming sign, like we're on the right track. Yeah. Thank you so much. Any other wonderful comment? Don't that be wonderful, actually. Any other comment or question? Or, yeah, because this is really, you know, so we go from chapter five to chapter nine, like we're just taming the mind and then all of a sudden it's non-duality and it's like a very big jump. Cage, was that a question from you? Oh. Well, I, I just remembered that there was someone emailed me this week and asking about what page and chapter we're oh, on. We're so on page, could announce that. We're on page 112, friends at home okay. and friends here. If you, no requirement to buy the book though, man, I really recommend it. Especially when you wake up in the middle of the night and you're like, I don't want to do anything that's too exciting. I want there to be something wholesome. You can just read a couple stanzas. And it's very nice. So it's um, not too exciting, but also very nourishing. Um, so yeah, I want to read this. Unless there's another question. I want to read this. Friends, friends at home, any questions? Good. Diane, everybody good? Hi, Walt. Nice to see you. Diane. In the chat. What's the name of the book? Oh, <laughs> no time to lose. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> just one more time here, so it can really sink in for us. Um, none of us wants to be miserable. We all want to be happy, but we can't achieve this if we stay stuck in a biased, narrow-minded thinking. No matter how much we long for joy, it will elude us if we continue buying into concepts of right and wrong, good and bad, acceptance and rejection. What ultimately frees us from constricting patterns is stop reifying our experience and to connect with the ineffable, groundless nature of all phenomena. I mean, it's, it's so not written clearly, but there's such a poetry to it. Um, and this uh, reifying is such a sophisticated word, but it really means like we identify, right? If we think that everything that matters and it is important is our sensory experiences, and they are great. Anybody see those sunset clouds tonight? Yeah. Like, that's amazing. They're beautiful, right? And yet if, if that is the ongoing source of our happiness, it, it gets foggy. There won't be a sunset and then we are miserable. So it's this idea that if we live our life with, I will only be good if, like my okayness is deeply connected and identified with the experience um, that's temporary, we're gonna be miserable. And then this invitation, which is just so, I find it so inspiring to connect with the ineffable groundless nature of all phenomena, meaning recognizing just that truth of impermanence, that truth of everything changing, and that there's something in that that's not sad and morbid. That's next week, by the way. We are going to go into <laughs> a little bit of um, mortality practice ahead of Day of the Dead. Um, so not just to connect with the ever-changing, impermanent, but to recognize, you know, when we recognize this term groundlessness, which sounds a little bit esoteric, like what does it mean to feel groundless? It almost means that we can have that sense, we sometimes glimpse in practice, that our awareness has no boundary. You know, just that unbelievable potential and openness of mind. And that nothing that we're kind of tethering and tying ourselves to really um, can prevent or limit that spaciousness of our awareness. It's a very inspiring like idea, but the feeling of it is a lot closer to this non-conceptual freshness of mind. You know, that, and that can only happen if we don't get caught up in our thoughts. What's in the way of us and non-conceptual freshness of mind? Getting like torn away by our thoughts, right? Of like, what am I gonna be for Halloween? What am I? I don't know. That's a <laughs> exciting one. Um, you know, we won't go to the what's going to happen in this election. <laughs> um, but any of that content that pulls us away, we miss just that beauty, that groundless nature, um, and seeing all the um, 
kind of, yeah, the illusory nature of phenomena arising. It can be a little scary. I know we've even had, I think you've had this, Tom, where like when the ground kind of comes out in practice and you're like, oh shit, where am I? <laughs> and there's such a beauty to it. Yeah. Question. Yeah. Maybe this is a good time for you. It's like, um, when you're talking about the, I mean, thank you for remembering that. That was really <laughs> stuck with me as well. Um, when we're talking about this unvarnished and unfettered and raw sort of experience, and I'm thinking like, it feels like so much of the problems that I have personally have to do with language, mm. like that I'm labeling things that that, that words yeah. are the re, that words are how things get reified because yes. because if I name something then it sort of has a different yeah like if I say oh this is sadness it means it has a different thing going on than if I'm just experiencing something and I'm wondering like when we're talking about how do we get there or what's out there is it sort of you know, non-language, like, say, like, sort of states there's sort of non-language. Yeah, it's much better for poetry. Yeah. <laughs> it really is, is, which is, I think, when, like, you know, I've noticed, I think I've said this before, but, like, when people increase in their spiritual practice, usually they start drinking more tea and buying more poetry. It's like, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why for the tea, but, like, poetry I get, because there is this language um, that's not so deliberate. And, and I think we've talked about this before here, but... There's a difference between experiencing moonlight and having someone point out the moon to you. And there's a danger always in confusing. It's like someone, the finger pointing at the moon, as it's classically said, for the moon itself. But in these, because um, I'm happy to say even very enlightened masters, it's a hard for them to just directly transmit meditation instructions. They all do use words. And then we can get confused and we think it's the words and not the experience. So it's a beautiful reminder. You know, it's the experience. The words are just scaffolding. I think sometimes I get caught up because I'm trying to sort of figure it out. Yeah. You know, that's very much a yeah. language based sort of thing. So yeah. I, yeah. And I think that's what I really appreciate about both you and the book is yeah. about this sort of poetic approach to this because it really does feel like there's kind of an emptiness that opens up yeah. where it's not like, first do this and then do this. And yes. then, you know, yes. systematic time. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. So let's see. So then, yeah, so she just kind of momentarily puts us into chapter nine and then we come back. Um, and there's kind of four of these. I'll just, I'll read these four. They all kind of go together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Therefore, I will seize this mind of mind, mind of mind, <laughs> and, then, and guard it well. What use to me are so many harsh, harsh austerities. Let me only discipline and guard my mind. And I love this because it's, you know, very much to um, kind of respond to some of the practices at the time. You know, when we read the story of the Buddha um, earlier this year, we know that Buddha spent a couple years working with intense austerities. And some of you may be in monasteries where you've seen these images of him and he's just like skin and bones. And um, it's the mortification practices. And he discovered as part of kind of the early foundation of what is now Buddhism, that there's this middle way. Yes, we need discipline, but we don't need those intense austerities. There actually needs to be some kind of um, sensory fullness you know, not deprivation. And so Shantideva saying, what, what's the use of these austerity practices? And either let me discipline my mind instead of kind of taking it out on my body. I'd say the 2024 version might be, what's the use of quantifying everything? <laughs> let me only, from a first person perspective, discipline and understand my mind. You know, this is someone who loves, of course, using technology to understand ourselves, and yet we get so caught up in that, right, that we miss out on what is it, you know, in the mind that we can actually learn to guard and safeguard. He says, when in wild, unruly crowds, we move with care to shield our broken limbs. Likewise, when we live in difficult company, our wounded minds, we should not fail to guard. So this idea of really protecting our minds, um, you know, we can't avoid wild, unruly crowds. 
you could maybe like do a little less doom scrolling and stuff like that. But we live in this world and there is wildness, there is unruliness, but we move with care and we shield our broken limbs. It's just this very beautiful way of thinking, you know, how do we kind of safeguard our mind? You know, not just, you know, binge watching horror movies, right? Um, there is an impact on our entire system when we're exposing ourselves to intensity. So how do we like safeguard that? For if I carefully protect my wounds because I fear the hurt of cuts and bruises, why should I not guard my wounded mind for fear of being crushed beneath the cliffs of hell? <laughs> and by cliffs of hell, um, he's generally talking about hatred, ignorance, right? Aversion, delusion. But this idea that we can, <clears throat> You know, if I would carefully protect my wounds, I don't want to be cut, why not also um, really guard this wounded mind? And this wounded mind means that we are all of us um, as humans, um, and certainly if we're coming into contact with the Dharma, we are in some kind of recovery, right? We want to understand and more deeply inhabit a sense of compassion and care for ourselves and others. And um, I don't like to think, I don't wanna you know, over identify us with woundedness, but this idea that so much of this world that we have been born into and that you know, for thousands of years has been the case, the woundedness is feeling separate and that we don't belong. And a mind that feels separate and that it doesn't belong can really get itself into some trouble in these wild, unruly crowds, right? We can get completely tossed side to side by craving and addiction and avoidance and aversion, and just numb out, just completely miss the meaning of this beautiful life. And, you know, this book and what I feel many of us in this room share is this, if not very strong, somewhat like this inclination that we are here for each other. Like this life is actually not about us getting to be in a place where we feel the most comfortable, the most joyful, but where we feel that we are of service to one another. We are in care with one another, both our inner circles and then radiating out. And that is, um, yeah, that is the beautiful aspiration of this. So with that, let's come together to set the intention and dedicate the merit of our practice, right? And taking a moment to just feel the field of this room. I can really sense so much genuine care and dedication here. And in this part of the practice, we really consider symbolically and energetically offering that dedication and care. Imagining that this dedication and care is a beautiful source of energy and light and wisdom and compassion. And if it feels natural and comfortable, placing the hands in front of the heart in a form of offering. And we offer all the energy and care that has been generated here tonight to this great vow of the Bodhisattva. May this energy be in service that each and every being could feel safe and protected, could know their true nature that each and every being of all time could feel love, could feel peace, and could feel perfectly free. So happy to be here with you all. Thank you.